Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Meshlove. Today we are going to explore the language of the gods, by which I mean Sanskrit. With me is Dr. Debashish Banerjee, who is the academic dean at the University of Philosophical Research in Los Angeles. He is also an adjunct faculty member at Pasadena City College and the California Institute of Integral Studies. Dr. Banerjee is the author of several books, including The Seven Quartets of Becoming, The Integral Yoga of Transformation, based on the diaries of Sri Aurobindo. He has also written Rabindranath Tagore in the 21st century and The Alternative Nation of Abhinindranath Tagore, who happens to be, incidentally, his great-grandfather. Welcome, Debashish. Thank you, Jeffrey. Always a pleasure to talk to you. It's a pleasure to be with you and to have this conversation about uh, an ancient, sacred language. I think most uh, of our viewers, and particularly Westerners, may not realize that English, the language in which we are now speaking, and Sanskrit yes. are yes. very much related to each other. Yes, and indeed, they both belong to the Indo-European language of uh, family of languages. And so there's a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's many words in English that are remarkably close to words in Sanskrit, mm -hmm. have the same uh, origin, in fact. Well, and of course, uh, because England uh, at one time had colonized yes. India, there's an awful lot of cultural exchange. That too, yes. Many Sanskrit words are common in English, but I imagine that's a result of the uh, colonization. Words like guru or pundit. Yes, a lot of Sanskrit words have entered the English dictionary, mm -hmm. and that's due to, as you point out, the ex cultural exchange that took place um, during uh, the colonial period. Uh, but also a lot of words in, in the English language have great similarities yes. to Sanskrit words mm -hmm. uh, due to the essential roots of Indo-European mm. language. In, in other words, family. many of the languages of Europe yes. are related to Sanskrit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Greek uh, is the origin. So the Greek language, uh, the, the Persian language, because uh, what are called the Indo-European languages includes the Iranian branch, mm -hmm. and the Sanskrit language have uh, lots of similarities because mm -hmm. of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. But Sanskrit in particular is associated with the uh, Vedic tradition, the Vedanta tradition. There's a, as these languages branched apart from each other, mm -hmm. Uh, the Sanskrit writings focused very much on uh, yoga, meditation, and the inner life of the mind. Quite, quite, absolutely, yes. So the Sanskrit language uh, developed uh, it's a life of its own in India. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever language it came from uh, was assimilated into the cultural atmosphere, in the kind of uh, speech. Uh, of India. And mm -hmm. so the Vedas were written in an early version of Sanskrit. It's called Vedic Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. And the word Sanskrit itself uh, means, uh, literally means well put together. I see. Uh, krit, which means to put together, to do, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and san, sans, or which is related to the word sum. Also in Latin and Greek, sum meaning to put together. Ah, uh -huh. So to put together well, well put together, Sanskrit, uh, because it's a very scientifically designed language. But when we talk about Sanskrit, we are talking about a language that was codified by grammarians a uh, little later, uh, while the origins are in what is called Vedic Sanskrit, which is a little more flexible mm. than uh, what we know as Sanskrit today. Well, I imagine it's fair to think of Sanskrit as being a language equivalent to Latin or maybe Biblical Hebrew, 
uh, languages that are no longer spoken, but that influence modern uh, spoken languages. Indeed, indeed. And they were spoken for a long time as well, mainly as court languages. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our the old texts, inscriptions, uh, things like that are still found in Sanskrit. And uh, right now there is a big movement to revive Sanskrit in India as a spoken language. Mm -hmm. But that's, of course, a modern phenomenon. Well, it certainly was done in Israel. Uh, Hebrew had been a completely dead language yeah. for centuries. Uh -huh. and, uh, now it's uh, alive. It's right. spoken by an entire nation. So mm -hmm. who knows? Who knows, yes. What yes. may happen. Well, let's uh, talk about the Vedas uh, yes. to begin with. These are the oldest written documents in Sanskrit. Undoubtedly, yes. And w one of the interesting things about the Vedas, to me, yes is that uh, it describes a mythology of uh, deities mm -hmm. very similar to the Greek and Roman uh, pantheons. Mm -hmm. Yes, and indeed, absolutely. Uh, for one thing I'd like to mention, since you said it's the oldest written uh, language, mm -hmm. uh, text, text, uh, wisdom text, mm -hmm. uh, it was not written for a long time. It was transferred by word of mouth mm -hmm. from teacher to student and through very strict laws of memorization mm -hmm. it was passed down for a long time and then finally it got written but you are indeed absolutely right it's the earliest wisdom literature mm -hmm. of, of, you know, of the world probably I see, I see. and um, you know what you were saying about uh, you know the way in which this uh, the, 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 the the symbolism uh, is very similar to the symbolism of the Greeks is, is, is indeed true mm -hmm. because the, the Vedic pantheon uh, can be matched often uh, almost with a one-to-one -one correspondence with, with the Greek. You have mm -hmm. uh, the sun god in both traditions. You have the king of the gods who is Zeus in the Greek pantheon yes. and Indra in the Indian pantheon mm -hmm. and they are both the lords of thunder, yes, uh, the thunderers, mm -hmm. no, known for throw, hurling thunderbolts. Hurling thunderbolts, uh -huh. right. Yeah. And then you have the goddess of wisdom, Athena, and you have Saraswati in the Indian tradition. Mm -hmm. You have Aphrodite, and you have Lakshmi. So there's uh, almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between a lot of these uh, gods. And, and, and that functions. suggests that there were earlier peoples who eventually settled both in Iran and in India and in Greece and, and pr probably also the Norse, Norse countries as well. Uh -huh. Th there's definitely some uh, Ur uh, mythology which mm -hmm. is translating between these uh, different regions. Ur meaning original. Uh, original, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd say with Zoroastrianism, you mm -hmm. find a lot of the same elements that are in the Vedas, the worship of the sun and of fire and the battle between the good and evil, between gods and demons. Mm -hmm. So uh, definitely there was some kind of ideas that uh, traveled. And then uh, in India, you find that they get a special form a form that relates to the spiritual life, the mm -hmm. yogic life. So we know, for example, today that the Greek uh, pantheon uh, had psychological meanings. Yes, They were related to the mysteries. Mm -hmm. And people actually went through transformative processes by using these uh, gods as psychological forces. Mm -hmm. um, in India, there is usually a tendency to see the Vedas purely as ritual literature. But more and more uh, studies are being done uh, which are revealing that indeed there's psychological meaning to the Vedic gods as well. Mm -hmm. They're part of a transformative uh, vocabulary, mm -hmm. uh, s a symbolic vocabulary through which people of that time were mm -hmm. extending their uh, spiritual life. Now, there was a very ancient culture in yes. India, the Indus Valley yes. civilization, yes. which uh, had its own language, maybe yes. pre-existing the Sanskrit. Yes. Very possibly, yes. And they, uh, from what we know of that civilization, mm -hmm. probably had developed the practices that are now known as yoga. 
Yes, very, very, very uh, possible. If you look at whatever material records we have from that civilization, there are sufficient, uh, you know, imagery mm -hmm. that give us to believe that they knew uh, processes of yoga and they were involved in uh, invoking uh, special powers, uh, what we may think of as paranormal powers, mm -hmm. uh, to extend the power of the human being uh, over the environment, over animals mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the forest, yes. and over other human beings. Mm -hmm. So they were using uh, yoga as a means to derive supernatural power. Mm -hmm. And I gather that the evolution of uh, the Sanskrit literature must mm -hmm. have had something to do with this uh, Aryan culture with their pantheon of gods, similar to the Greeks and Romans, mm -hmm. encountering this other tradition which was uh, meditative and perhaps shamanistic mm -hmm. and tantric and mm -hmm. involved uh, yoga. True, absolutely, I completely agree. So there was um, a shamanistic tradition, as you mentioned. In fact, the word for shaman-like beings in India is shraman. Uh -huh. It just has an extra A. Yes. And it's, it's probably exactly the same word mm -hmm. that makes its way to India and we get the term shraman. Mm. Shraman is a wandering ascetic, mm. uh, often with paranormal powers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you either had individual shramans or you had groups of shramans uh, that were that formed little collectives, uh, and it's very possible that in the Indus Valley you had people of this kind who entered into society and were actually very influential in society. Mm -hmm. They may even have controlled the society; may mm -hmm. have been like priest kings. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there is a certain kind of uh, uh, prevalence of these practices within society yeah. itself. And, and when we talk about the civilization of the Indus Valley, yes. we're, we're talking about something maybe four or five thousand years ago, a contemporary with the early civilizations of Egypt and Samaria. Quite true. Uh, the peak of the Indus Valley takes place about, uh, I'd say, uh, close to 5,000 years back, about 2700 BCE. Mm -hmm. uh, it begins peaking. Uh, but you find that its roots are in settlements that go all the way back to about 8,000 BC. Mm -hmm. So there's a gradual increase in urbanism and in technology till finally we come to these extremely, uh, you know, sort of developed societies mm -hmm. around 2700 BC. Mm -hmm. And it keeps peaking, uh, it keeps continuing to progress till about 1500 BC. And then there is a kind of a desertion of these towns. Mm -hmm. And so that's the Indus Valley and then the, the material records seem to dwindle after that. Mm -hmm. And again, we have a lot more activity which we see almost a thousand years later, around the third century or say the fifth century BC. Well, it, it, and this undoubtedly involved the migrations of people and Correct. the fusion of various local cultures and external yes. invaders. Uh, but at the same time, I think what we're seeing is uh, the development of a very refined philosophy yes. in Sanskrit, the Vedantic tradition. Absolutely, very true. Uh, largely, the migration of people from the Indus Valley today uh, is attributed to tectonic plate shifts mm -hmm. that caused a lot of flooding and uh, drying up of some rivers and flooding in other rivers. Mm -hmm. So people found it untenable to live in those regions and they started moving out. But you're absolutely right in that the literature that developed after this, uh, the Vedic literature, uh, must have absorbed some of the practices. And mm -hmm. so it's a language that from the very beginning is adapted to the spiritual life. Yes. This is why people have named it the language of the gods. Mm -hmm. Because it's, you know, also you mentioned that maybe in the future it'll be a spoken language again. Mm -hmm. There's one thing in that language that actually lends itself to the future very powerfully. It's the ease with which it discusses the inner life of the human mm -hmm. being, the, the psychological, you know, depth psychology of human being and, and its possibilities. Mm -hmm. 
this is one of the reasons why a lot of words have come into the English language. Yeah. But yeah, from the very beginning, there is an emphasis on that kind of, of vocabulary mm -hmm. that will let us describe a deeper human being. Well, like ancient Greek or ancient Hebrew or Latin, it's thought of as a sacred language, yes, yes. not a secular language, right. although it must have had some secular sure, uses. Sure. But yes, uh, sacred yes. languages in general are different from secular languages in, in several respects, one mm. of them being uh, the notion of mantra. Right, right, right. L let's talk about that. Yes, yes. So from, when we look back at the past, the Rig Veda is considered to be the most uh, powerful mantric literature of India. So it, it, it's supposed that the hymns mm -hmm. are, uh, you know, a combination of sounds uh, that have effects on the consciousness of the hearer and can transmit experiences. Mm -hmm. So this is the whole idea of the mantra and the theory of the mantra is developed over centuries in India where people have given it very sof sophisticated formulations. Mm -hmm. I mean, even down to the 10th and 11th century, we have very important texts that are talking about the theory of mantra, mm -hmm. about how some sounds have specific uh, vibrational effects mm -hmm. on the human system and how words can actually be combined in such a way that they open up experiences mm -hmm. in the in the in the, in the, psych, in the psyche. Yeah. Now, for example, probably most of our viewers are familiar with the Sanskrit mantra Om. Yes. Can we talk about that? Yes. So Om is considered to be the primordial sound. They give it the they give it the term or the phrase. Um, uh, the unwounded sound, mm -hmm. uh, you know, anahata, which means uh, that which has not been struck, that which is not wounded because nothing has struck it. Mm -hmm. In other words, we think of all sound as being produced by the striking of two different objects. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you say that the, it is the sound that hasn't been struck, you're actually reminded of the Japanese koan. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Yes. In other words, we are being, being told that there is a causeless vibration to this cosmos. There is some original vibration that nothing caused, and that is the Om. So there is a very important Upanishad that is all devoted completely to the single sound Om. Now you've introduced a new word, Upanishad. Right. Let's right. define that. Okay, so if Veda is the earliest body of texts, uh, the next really important body of Indian ancient texts written in Sanskrit are the Upanishads. And Upanishads literally means to sit near. Uh, Upanishad means I'm sitting close to, sitting near. Uh -huh. And so it, it has two meanings. On the one hand, it's talking about a social tradition of guru and shishya, the teacher and the student mm -hmm. that is developing around that time. So that by sitting close to the teacher, by living close to the example of the teacher, by living in the, in the environment of the teacher, they're picking up certain mm -hmm. things. And the literature that is in, in, involved, that is uh, facilitating that is Upanishads. Mm -hmm. uh, the but we're not meaning, talking about any teacher now. We're talking about a, a guru, a spiritual teacher who is not just instructing in concepts or techniques, yeah. but in uh, states of consciousness. In that, states that, of consciousness. That are, and it's not just instruction, it's transmission. It's transmission, right. And the other meaning of that term has to do with uh, the nature of the language. Mm -hmm. To sit near is a reference or a description of a kind of language that is really close to the truth. It sits, it's intimate with the truth. It's mm -hmm. a language of intimacy with the truth. Yeah. So what happens with the Upanishads is that it is a contemplation, a literature of contemplation, or whatever the sentence is, again, mantric in that sense, but not merely vibration. It has got vibration, but it also appeals to the mind as a, a set of... Uh, premises for mm -hmm. contemplating. Mm -hmm. And as one contemplates these premises, uh, these mantras come alive and one has experiences. Mm -hmm. So this whole Upanishad that's based on the Om is talking about the four 
conditions of 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 consciousness you know the avasthas or uh, the states of waking uh, sleeping dreamless sleep and the fourth unmentionable state uh, so the, the the description of these is related to the syllables in the term om mm -hmm. and i think so from a very early time om has been used as a mantra that gives access to the entire continuum of consciousness. And when you talk the about the fourth states. inexpressible yes. state of consciousness, I presume you're, you're bringing up a kind of what we might think of as super consciousness. Qu quite true. So I think um, first the waking state is what we all experience, the waking state where, where we are in the world with our senses outwards. Mm -hmm. uh, the, what is called the dreaming state or the sleeping state is essentially not just sleep, but states of trance where we turn our senses inward. Mm -hmm. It's the entire spectrum of the inner life, one may say. And the third one is called Shushupti, and that literally translates to sleeping in sleep. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a reflexive sleep. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, it's a kind of lucid dreaming in which one translates from one state of normal dream, dreaming to a state which transcends waking and sleeping, mm -hmm. or waking and dreaming. Okay. And that kind of condition is, is already a super conscience. Yes. And so th that is the third state. And the fourth state is completely without content because one enters into a samadhi uh, which is so transcendental that one cannot bring back anything from there. Mm -hmm. But one uh, merges into perfect bliss. And then uh, that is one of the stations of, of the continuity or continuum of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I have a friend I've interviewed in years past, sure. long deceased, who worked at one time at the University of sure. Philosophical Dean Research. Brown, Dean Brown, yes, yes. yes. and uh, who was a Sanskrit scholar yes, as, as well. And he once suggested to me that the uh, mantra Om mm -hmm. is also the origin, he felt linguistically, of the word human, that mm -hmm. human and Om are somehow related to each other if we look at what is, you know, the deep nature of right, the right. individual. It's beautiful, that's a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, idea, and it may be very tr true. Mm -hmm. It's very possible because, again, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Sanskrit is a mantric language, mm -hmm. and there is an Indo-European family of languages. If we really listen to the Sanskrit sounds, we'll find a resonance with a number of uh, other sounds in the Indo-European language. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, that's how we arrive at intuitive understandings of uh, uh, how things like this, the human, human, om and human, mm -hmm. uh, there may be a connection there, that, that that is probably the origin of the human, because the human is the being that actually, in potential at least, bridges all these uh, conditions of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the human. Well, we'll be uh, talking in greater depth about uh, these things, but we just have a, a few minutes left now, and I'd like to introduce another Sanskrit concept, which I think uh, is relevant, and that's the notion of Maya, or yes. the goddess of Maya, because it, it's almost like uh, the old Monty Python saying, everything you know is wrong. <laughs> yeah. So um, Maya, the idea of Maya comes in the Upanishads again. Mm -hmm. And it's used uh, in a way to talk about the creation, or the power of creation mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the Supreme Being. Or for them, the Supreme Being is reality and everything there is in reality. Mm -hmm. So um, if the state of pure existence, everything that exists, is intrinsically divine, then from that, how has the world of uh, things appeared? The yes. many objects in the world mm -hmm. and their relations mm -hmm. appeared. And they use the term Maya to talk about that. So Maya has become a term that has been interpreted variously by various people. Mm -hmm. In its most essential sense, all it means is the creative power of Brahman, mm -hmm. the creative power of the divine. Yes. And in that sort of term, in that way, when we look at it, it's really the self-reflexivity ref of Brahman, mm -hmm. Brahman turning on itself. Mm -hmm. 
it's a monism that becomes a dualism mm -hmm. because the one looks at itself and its own infinite potential and it's, it's bringing, as soon as it views its infinite potential, it, it brings it into manifestation. Mm -hmm. So that power of uh, self-regard is maya. Okay, now I uh, was taught something different. Yes. And many people, I think, uh, are, are taught that maya means illusion or confusion, yes. that if we're not connected to, to that one source, to Brahman, to, yes. the, to the divinity of absolutely everything, yes. Then, yes. then we're trapped in maya or yes. illusion. Is, is that also correct? It's correct in a certain sense, because if the self-regard of Brahman produces a word, which is the self-description of Brahman, yes. and you think that that is Brahman, mm -hmm. then you're caught in a certain appearance. Mm -hmm. It is the appearance of, of the mirror of Brahman. But if we think that that is not really an appearance, but it is a manifestation of Brahman, mm -hmm. then we can find the connection back to the source. Mm -hmm. And that is the way in which Maya can be overcome and not be a trap, an entrapment. I, I say it's a subtle concept as, yeah, it is as you concept. explain it. That yeah. uh, it's as if this uh, delusion that we're in is also part of the grand plan of creation. True, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It is also part of the self-expression uh, of the divine. And so, so if we take it to be absolute, then we are trapped. Mm -hmm. But if we take it to be something which is the expression of something true, then we find the truth in it. And so yoga becomes the process by which instead of escaping from Maya's world, we find the truth of Maya's world and we can live in it as the divine sees it. Mm -hmm. Devashish Banerjee, thank you so much for sharing this half hour with me. Thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. And thank you for being with us. Be sure to check your listings for part two of our three-part series on the language of the gods with Dr. Debashish Banerjee. Thank you.